All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I guess everyone is in Singapore, so it's it's a good afternoon. Uh, can you hold? Me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's a pleasure to uh, uh, launch this uh, meeting today with uh, Professor Thomas Lecuy from Collège de France. It's a special uh, guest of this uh, science innovation lecture series. And before we go further, I'll pass the, uh, <clears throat> the floor to Rong Lee, the director of the Mechanobiology Institute in Singapore. And she will tell a few words about MBI and the link of MBI with France. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's a real honor for MBI to be the uh, local partner for this uh, third France Singapore Science and Innovation Lecture by uh, uh, this time by Professor Tamar Lequy. So um, just a few words about MBI. So we were uh, established in 2009 as a research center of excellence uh, supported by Singapore uh, Ministry of Education uh, and uh, NRF and also NUS. MBI is one of the world's only dedicated research institute that focuses on mechanobiology, which is a discipline of science focusing on the physical and mechanical aspects of biological processes. One of the uh, important, area, uh, important areas of mechanobiology is, is about how forces are generated and transmitted to shape cells and tissues and organ morphogenesis during development. And I believe this is one of the uh, 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 main focus and also topic of uh, Dr. Lequis' uh, 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 presentation today. One of MBI's mission is to be, uh, in addition to do excellent research, is to be an international hub for mechanobiology. So we, we are very proud to have had a long-standing collaboration with French in scientists. Uh, Professor Virgil Viesnoff is an excellent example. He has been a principal investigator at MBI and NUS since 2010. He leads one of the, the five international research laboratories uh, in Singapore that are jointly supported by CNRS and MBI at NUS. We have also extended um, co-principal investigator or visiting professor positions to scientists from uh, leading institutes in France with great success. The best example is Professor Jacques Pro uh, from uh, Institute Curie who has been a uh, distinguished professor uh, to MBI since 2014. He brings to us his knowledge in soft uh, matter physics to, MB to mechanobiology. He has mentored a group of uh, theoreticians at MBI and also helped MBI scientists to incorporate physics theories in their work. This also highlights the power of interdisciplinary science, which is the core to MBI research. There are also um, numerous other distinguished French scientists with whom MBI scientists have collaborated with great productivity uh, and success, publishing many joint papers. So this collaboration between uh, MBI and NUS and French institutes and scientists has been uh, highly fruitful. So we hope that in the future, we're going to continue to build on this partnership uh, in our pursuit of new directions uh, on mechanobiology, uh, especially in the mechanobiology of development, aging, and tissue engineering. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to uh, 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 give the podium back to, to Virgil. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rong. Um, I guess Monsieur Ambassador will have a few words also to explain the links uh, and the specifics of that uh, NRF uh, French Embassy uh, lecture series. So, Monsieur Ambassador, please. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, Professor Zhongli, uh, Professor Thomas Lecuy, uh, Professor Virgil Viasnov, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a great pleasure for me to open this uh, fourth uh, lecture of the French Singapore Science and Innovation uh, Lecture Series, which are co organized by the Collège de France and the National Research Foundation and the French Embassy. It's a, a series that we started uh, in 2019 and it, it consists in presentation uh, from eminent professors from both France and uh, Singapore. 
and the aim is to not only share uh, knowledge uh, in a very uh, specific uh, disciplines, but also, I mean, to uh, uh, generate a further collaboration uh, between our two uh, countries. So uh, we had a first, I mean, uh, uh, the honor to welcome in Singapore in 2019, uh, Professor uh, Philippe Sansonetti, uh, a worldwide renowned researcher in microbiology and infectious disease. And uh, as you know, his, uh, his work has been particularly uh, valuable during the COVID crisis. In January 2020, uh, we also uh, received Professor Alain Fischer, uh, who is now in charge of the COVID-19 vaccine task force uh, in France, and who delivered um, a lecture on the curative approaches of gene therapy. And last November, we had also uh, Professor Hugues de T, uh, who gave a lecture on the mode of action of targeted le leukemia uh, therapies, uh, and that was a, a lecture uh, given uh, online. So this uh, lecture series uh, is held under uh, the uh, aegis of what is called the France-Singapore Joint Science and Innovation Committee, which was uh, set up uh, both by Deputy uh, Prime Minister Hong Sui Kiat and uh, the French Minister for Higher Education, Research and Innovation, Frédéric Vidal. And this uh, committee's main uh, uh, objective is to uh, deliver a shared approach on the strategic guidelines for uh, research and innovation between our two countries. And also, I mean, to generate uh, more uh, collaboration with uh, uh, the whole uh, stakeholders in a specific uh, area. And that was set up in November uh, 2019. And we are now preparing for the second uh, session of this uh, joint committee, uh, which uh, will be held uh, in uh, June uh, this year. Uh, there are many, uh, several verticals uh, in this, um, in this uh, joint committee, uh, circular economy, climate change, artificial intelligence, and also uh, biotech. And so we are at the moment I mean, organizing the workshops in the perspective of the, uh, the joint committee uh, by uh, end of June. Uh, let me also mention that during this uh, COVID crisis, uh, we use uh, the opportunity to accelerate on certain areas of collaboration and mainly, of course, uh, on health and digital health and, uh, of course, on uh, infectious disease. And uh, we have uh, set up uh, a joint uh, bilateral uh, group uh, on uh, infectious disease, uh, not limited to the, the COVID, uh, but uh, encompassing uh, all uh, other infectious disease, and uh, which will uh, report uh, to the, the joint committee uh, next June. And uh, there are very promising uh, areas of collaboration already identified. So today I'm uh, particularly uh, Please, I mean, to uh, uh, welcome Professor Thomas Lecuy, uh, a renowned CNRS uh, scientist. Uh, Thomas Lecuy uh, was uh, elected at the French Academy of Science in 2014 uh, and appointed professor at the Collège de France in uh, 2016. Uh, and uh, his um, lecture today, I mean, will uh, contribute uh, to the dynamism of uh, research and innovation between our two countries that I was uh, referring referring to. And I want also to uh, express my gratitude to Professor Zhongli uh, for hosting uh, this uh, event uh, at the uh, Mechanobiology Institute. And I know that it's uh, very early uh, for you. So thanks again, Professor. And uh, last but not least, I mean, to Professor uh, Vyasnov, uh, who is uh, really the pivot uh, to uh, for the collaboration between uh, CNRS uh, and uh, MBI. Uh, heading, I mean, the BMC2 uh, laboratory that I, I visited a few times uh, here in, uh, in Singapore. So I thank you also uh, Virgil for his uh, contribution, I mean, to uh, transnational and interdisciplinary research uh, between our, our uh, two countries. Thank you very much, and I wish you a very uh, fruitful and uh, enjoyable uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Setting, thank you for setting the stage. I think with no further ado, I'll uh, hand the podium to uh, Thomas for his talk. But just, just before that, I uh, encourage you to ask question in the chat as the talk goes on, and I'll uh, either read it or uh, I don't know if technically we'll, you'll have uh, opportunity to ask the questions yourself at the end, I guess so. But it's better if they're all written in the chat so that if we don't have enough time, we can also pass them to Thomas Lecuy afterwards. So with no further ado, Thomas, I uh, leave it to you for this talk. <laughs> 
So I trust that you, um, it, it works, it's perfect, that you hear me and you see me, you can see my slides. So thank you uh, for uh, organizing this event. Thank you, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. Thank you, Wang Li. Thank you, Virgil, for uh, this uh, great opportunity. Of course, it would have been much better to be in Singapore, but I think we have to adapt to circumstances. And uh, today I would like to entertain you with what I regard as a very fundamental question in life sciences, which is basically trying to account for the um, um, property of living system to be organized. What we call morphogenesis is referring to the fact that living systems are not random piece of, of matter as we see around, but rather extremely organized. And actually this image from uh, my first slide shows you know, an extract of animals uh, from the oceans, which uh, um, uh, stems from the Terra expedition, which many of you may, must be aware of, which has gone around the world to extract and describe um, you know, life in the oceans. And it's to me, one of the most vivid illustrations of the variety of shapes that uh, manifest in the living world. And my lab and my research interest and my teaching at the Collège de France all revolve around trying to address these fundamental problems of how life is organized. And of course, this is a very lofty goal. Uh, my humble uh, contribution is trying to address this problem in, a, in, a, in an organism that we can uh, tackle in the lab, which is the fruit fly. But what I will say uh, has the ambition of, of pertaining to any kind of living form. Um, and uh, in my title, you can see that I put the word information because this is a very uh, fundamental uh, concept in um, life sciences, which from our research um, is, is, is requires some further clarification and, and presentation. So my talk will revolve around the problem of what is the information that underlies the organization of living matter and organisms. So in my next slide, you can see what would be sort of the zeroth order example of shape in, uh, in animals. This is an animal that maybe some of you have not heard of. It's a placozoa. It's called Trichoplax adherence, and this is work from Manu Prakash at Stanford University. It's an organism that lives in the ocean, and it's very basal to most animals we know. It's basal to you know, uh, the splitting from all the things that you can see on the right, on the left, sorry, tinnophores, porifera, etc. It's, it's, it's probably our common ancestor is uh, you know, over 500 million years ago. And the characteristics of this organism is that it's a bit like a Namibia. It has no particular shape. It's a random shape, so to say. It's a sheet of cells that you can see depicted on the uh, bottom left here. It's a few millimeters across. And this organism has a, a characteristic um, kind of motion that is um, um, not particularly oriented. There's no head, no tail, no pattern, so to say. And you can see on this other movie, that it even decide to split like pieces of you know of uh, of uh, rubber, and um, it's it's interesting to think of such animals being completely unorganized from the principles of of you know what developmental biology study, and nonetheless have many common features that uh, you know we could discuss later on. So these I present sort of as a stage to say well in fact there exist examples in which animals do not seem to have particular shape. Uh, at least organized shapes. And I want to, all that I will say will be in contrast to that sort of state of organization. So in my next slide, you see what I would call, you know, vivid examples of dynamic uh, uh, shapes in the context of uh, living organisms. And you can see it across scales. Take a single cell, like this green alga, it's dividing as you see it now. And you can see that the very elaborate pattern evolves as the cells uh, duplicates its, its content. And so this is you know, patterns as it emerges during cell division. Now you can take at the bottom, the example of a sea urchin embryo. It's the very beginning of life of a sea urchin embryo. It's like basically the beginning of life of any animal like us. It's a single cell that is going to divide from two cells and then four and, and eight and so on and so forth. The characteristic feature is that the cells division are obviously not random. They are very much orchestrated in time and space. And so you immediately grasp the notion that there must be some information that um, uh, orchestrates the time, space, uh, special features of cell division so that the early embryo does not have a random shape, but actually a very organized stereotypical shape. 
And on the right, you would see, you know, uh, sort of another example at an even larger scale. You can no longer discern individual cells, but you know that there are a few tens of thousand cells that make, you know, a tissue or several tissues. And these tissues actually organize such that you have patterns. You can progressively recognize in these small fish, zebra fish, you know, the segments, the head region, the brain, and so on and so forth. So really across scales, cells have a capacity to organize themselves in such a way that shape emerge in characteristic patterns. So this is a very fundamental question which has captured the attentions of scientists for centuries, literally. And of course, with the means of new technology and a more elaborate science, and in particular, the interdisciplinary setting that was discussed earlier in the introduction, one that is very much uh, elaborate, you know, developed in Singapore and also in Marseille in the Turing Center, we could tackle these problems in new ways. These are all questions which we can provide answers to in new ways, especially from the standpoint of physics and biology. And that is exactly what would be the, uh, my presentation uh, to you about today. So to put things in more sort of a conceptual framework, when you say that there are patterns and shapes, and you can see here on the top, now what is a two photon movie of a um, fly embryo, the organism that we study as a model organism in the lab, you can see sort of these single layers of epithelial cells, and you can see that specific dynamics emerge, which I'll come back to in a second. Now such, mo such motion, you know, there's a long tradition to understand it from the standpoint of genetic encoding. We mean by that, that uh, these patterns, reproducible patterns of cells is dictated or orchestrated by genes, which control their biochemical products, proteins, which themselves control mechanics, such as contractility. And the uh, specification of gene activity in networks of activity, the biochemical products can really dictate how contractility, the active forces acting within cells can actually dictate particular kind of dynamics at the cellular level. And from that, you can predict shape as an outcome. But I would like to entertain you with another module of information, so to say, which is geometry. I mean by that, that it's not just the specification of gene activity in biochemistry, nor the sole specification of mechanics, which dictates motion, that is sufficient to predict the outcome in terms of shape. It is also the geometry. In the context of the uh, system that I refer to, I mean that, for instance, the shape of the egg, which is an ellipsoid, is not random, it's inherited, and I'll come back to that later on. And I will show you in my presentation towards the end, that is a very important, essential piece of information, equally important as genes to actually dictate a specific outcome. So we'll come back to that, but just consider for now that we uh, have on the table three modules of information, biochemistry, was it genetic encoding, geometry, and mechanics. And the key question really is, how are these three models interacting with one another? And uh, what is characteristics about um, these modules of information is that uh, information is really dictating length scales and time scales. And to give you one example amongst many, um, chemistry can dictate length scales and time scales because a molecule can diffuse and form a, a gradient of diffusion. Think of the morphogen concepts in tissues, but also a chemical gradient within a cell. Such chemical gradient have a recognizable mathematical um, form, which you know, gives rise to a length scales, which depends on diffusion coefficient and degradation of the molecules that we consider. There's also a time scale, which is directly related to similarly diffusion and the length scales. And so really we can uh, partition a field by uh, the, the properties of diffusion of the molecules. That is one example of how you can define time and space from within using chemistry. And this is an example of a fly embryo where actually this is not just something there, it's actually essential for the patterning of the early fly embryo. This is work dating back to the late 80s, early 90s, um, and has been shown to be important in um, many organisms. But it turns out that there's another way that you can define length scales and time scales from within, which is just by mechanics. Uh, to give you an example, if you apply a stress on a material, a living cell or a tissue, it turns out that um, unlike a spring in which you predict that the deformation will propagate all the way through the spring, in fact, given certain properties such as viscosity and stiffness of this material, which is you know, a characteristic feature of living material, viscoelasticity, well, the, propagate, the deformation will not be uh, propagating everywhere, but will be confined to a given region. 
And the length scale over which that deformation will be uh, perceived and uh, incurring is called the hydrodynamic length scales, which depends on viscosity and friction gamma. And likewise, you can define a time scale, which is going to be dependent upon the ratio of viscosity and stiffness. So all that I mean to say here is that the internal mechanical property, material properties of living system give rise to time scales and length scales, which could be very important to state how far and at what speed deformation can propagate given a stress that are um, built from within or actually uh, perceived from the outside. And so really mechanics, just as much as by chemistry, can define time scales and length scales and therefore they can be used as information content to specify dynamics in a cell or a tissue. And I would like to finish this sort of introduction by presenting the third module of information, which is geometry. What I mean literally is that given stress, which may be internal shown in green or external shown in red, think of how you can pull from within and pull from the outside, a tissue will have a certain deformation, but that will depend on sort of the, the environments, the boundaries which, to which the tissue is attached. For instance, on the uh, left here, you can see that the tissue is stitched to a, a gray bar, which is a wall, so to say. And if you pull on this system, well, of course, you will deform it along the axis of in which you pull. This is pretty much the way that a wing in a fly uh, is, uh, is actually formed. There are uh, active stresses and there is uh, attachment to another region and the geometry of that uh, uh, activity will dictate sort of the one dimensional extension of the wing. But in an embryo, the boundaries are not linear, they are curved. And that gives rise uh, to actually the, a, a flow of the whole material uh, like a fluid, which really is not linear, but actually curvy linear, which actually moves along the boundary of the whole egg. The third example is for instance, if you had a circular boundary, it's not just nor linear, nor curvilinear, it's a circle. Well, in that case, the same active internal and external stresses will give rise to an invagination or a dome. So really the boundary will just have a very profound different impact. And the last example would be now, if you keep the same geometry, which is circular, but you now decide to flip 90 degrees the orientation of the stress, well, then what you expect is to have some kind of rotational flow because the stress will be tangential and not radial to the, in, in this geometry. And that would give rise to rotation, like a wheel. And this is exactly what you see in some developmental processes shown on the bottom right. So really that shows you that it's not just the active stresses or the chemical activity that matters, it's just the geometry of the tissue. So really we have biochemical, geometric and mechanical modules of information. And now we ask, are these modules, how are these modules interacting with one another? I put uh, arrows in all directions to show that in principles, everything could interact with one another. But I would like to finish my introduction by outlining two modes of thinking about how these modules interact with one another, which has a very profound impact in terms of thinking about how life, living matter is organized. And it turns out has an impact even beyond if you think about how you manage information in say an institution, a company, uh, whatever you might think of a university. And that is the first example is what we call a program. So by that, I mean that if you build a building, you want to have a hierarchical flow of information. There is, um, um, and, and not only do you have hierarchy, but you often have also modularity. You have modules of activity. The key notion here is both hierarchy and the existence of deterministic rules. This is represented schematically by the fact that the arrows are in one direction. The patterning chemical activities that you inherit from the mother in the fly egg, for instance, and the geometry of the egg will dictate, really dictate, orchestrate how cell and tissue mechanics emerge. And this is going to be a one directional, one directional flow of information. There's a long tradition in developmental biology to think about uh, development from the standpoint of the execution of a genetically encoded program. But it turns out that there is another way of thinking about organization, which is very much inspired from physics, which is called self-organization. It is shown on the right in a provocative way by this picture of a, a Tomite mound, which is organized as if it was a cathedral. Of course, as you know, in a Tomite mound or in an ant colony, there's no um, uh, um, architect. No one knows what they're doing. They're doing their small business locally, 
There's no hierarchy at all. There are only local interactions, but there are many feedbacks with environment and among themselves. And most importantly, the rules of interactions are not deterministic. They are purely stochastic and they are described statistically. Now with this notion of no hierarchy, statistical rules and many feedbacks, you can have emergence of complex patterns from very little um, uh, specification of, 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 of inter interactions. And really these two modes of organization, pure self-organization and program are at play in any living system at any moment. And we're interested in how these two modes of organization work together to explain the very robust reproducible emergence of shapes in organisms. And so it has a very profound implication in terms of thinking also about repair. You know, regeneration will build upon the capacity to self-organize, but will not be possible if there was no template to be used to actually elaborate as if in a program, future events and repair. So, so much for the general introduction. Let's see how it actually materialized in the context of the early embryo, the fly embryo. So here, what you can see is, um, for those not familiar with that, is a patterning of early fly embryo. You can see colors and that represents in a cascade or, and, and that was the work that was awarded a Nobel Prize in the mid-90s by the work of Vishaus and Nislan Volart and Ed Lewis, because they really showed that in the fly, the um, coordinates of, an, of a cell in an embryo uh, result from a hierarchical flow of information from so-called maternal genes, which then dictates other genes. And eventually you will have colors for each individual cells, which reflects the position along the anterior posterior or ventral axis. And that will actually define later on specific differentiation features, which you can see in this little maggot at the bottom. So this is, you know, what is so-called the positional information program that stems from, uh, that happens in the early fly embryo. It turns out that this detailed positional information is going to control in a way that is very precise, what I call cortical mechanics. What I refer to specifically is active contractility within cells, which is going to allow the cell to change its shape, to move about in a way that is very much orchestrated in space and time. And such oriented cell behaviors, whether cell division, cell motility, cell shape changes, they are actually the fundamental feature that allow a tissue to change shape. And for example, at the bottom you see on the right, the extension of a tissue, which happens in every single animal. And on the left, another very general feature, how you make two tissues from one, the precursor of muscles and guts from the uh, outside of the embryo called the ectoderm. This is called an invagination. So this is the you know, a characteristic example of how execution of a program genetically encoded can give rise to or explain morphogenesis. And in an example, which would be important for later on, you can see here, well, actually, what do we know uh, about how you invaginate a tissue? The tissue now here is sort of simplified. We only look at the surface of the iceberg, the so-called apical surface. And you can see a band of cells marked in orange is going to uh, cross a little folding in the tissue. This is because all these individual cells receive an information, which is genetically encoded, that tells them, well, now shrink your apical surface. The cells become tiny, and because they're tiny, they will actually cause this little invagination. How do they become smaller? Well, because they actually build up contractility. Just like you have muscles, each cells have their own local contractile uh, apparatus, which um, is seen here in this green structure, which is uh, composed of a motor molecule called myosin 2, which is activated in specific ways. And as it contracts, it's going to reduce the apical surface because it exerts literally uh, active forces against the boundaries of the cells. And this is shown by these red arrows. So now how is this really a genetic program? Well, in fact, those cells at the ventral half of the embryo receive an information that is genetically encoded. They receive, a, there's a gradient of information that is coming from the mother, put in the egg, and that is going to activate specifically in the ventral half, uh, specific transcription factors in red, which activate then later on myosin 2 in the apical surface. So these cells are fated to be different genetically, and they interpret that information to change the mechanics. They activate contractility, not at the base, which is here, but in the apical surface. And this local flip in the where cells are contractile is going to cause a change in geometry, a change in curvature. And that's the precursor of an event called gastrulation. And, and really the way this is done is like a switch. You have a machinery. It's not an electric circuit, it's a genetic circuit. 
all cells contain all a battery of molecules. The details don't matter here. And at the end of it, you have this motor, which is literally causing deformation from the hydrolysis of a chemical bond. And they do so because there are switch factors shown in red. And the switch factors are only induced in the red territories here. So it's a genetic switch that has a direct predictable outcome in terms of contractility and deformation. So this is an example, but there are many examples across organisms, across animals of such a paradigm to think about morphogenesis, which is genetically encoded. Now, I would like to now sort of contrast this view by showing how, in fact, development in organisms is not just strictly speaking, solely genetically encoded. And that will uh, be very um, uh, clear when I present to you um, uh, another kind of deformation that happens in the early fly embryo. And this is uh, the posterior of the embryo, which is the precursor of the gut, is called the endoderm. And what you can see on this movie is uh, first that there is characteristic dynamics. Um, it takes uh, place over a few tens of minutes. The cells are going to flow and, and rotate to where the top, which is the dorsal part of the embryo, and they are going to transport in a little pocket the precursor of the uh, gonad. These are here the germ cells, which will be inherited and protected in this little pocket. So what we try to ask is how is it that this tissue really has this characteristic rotation as the tissue uh, extends? So this is the work of two people, a physicist, a student, and a guy who's left the lab, and a biologist, Claudio, who you've seen the picture of before. So if you look at the top of this embryo, what you see is actually um, a contractility of cells very much like what I've showed you before. You have myosin 2, in, seen in red, in green, which is going to be activated in the precursor territory, the primordium of this tissue. This is going to happen in a way that I'm not going to detail, but it's tri strictly genetic. But later on, something happens, which is very uh, surprising, which is that there is a wave of propagation. A wave, literally like, you know, when you have this domino that flips, you can have the first domino that you push and the rest of the domino is going to fall in a cascade. Here, um, we're talking about the, a cascade of activation of myosin 2 in cells that initially didn't have any contractility to begin with. So there's really a wave of uh, contractility in green, which is associated with a wave of tissue deformation and invagination. How is this happening? And in answering this question, we'll describe that actually, the process is not strictly genetically encoded, although it has a genetic component. And that will allow us to expand or revisit our framework to think about uh, morphogenesis and how activities is controlled. So we define a precursor, a primordium in, in yellow, and a green territory, which is a place where the tissue has a wave of deformation. And you can see it now in sort of still images, uh, the, the white cells at a distance will activate mice into about half an hour after the, uh, the process began. And you can actually look at this quantitatively um, in this representation of, so I have a problem, I need to restart my presentation. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, it will take me just a second. So please bear with me a second. So I was about to show you that you can represent and quantify this process um, in uh, um, quantitatively and see that actually the cells uh, have this linear progression through um, the uh, tissue is seen as a line of linear propagation. Now, just for you to see more precisely the wave of activity, you can see in green here, myosin 2 is activated and progressively propagates through the tissue from the left to the right. I'm skipping the details at the bottom. I want now to show you that the process is initiated genetically. In the posterior part of the embryo, shown on the left in blue, you have switch factors that are going to activate the very same motor myosin 2 through the very same pathway that is activating myosin 2 the ventral half of the embryo. The switch are different in nature, but what they do is exactly the same. So this is an example of how evolution can actually create the same processes using different initiators and trigger. Now, the first model shows you that uh, we could think of it as being genetically encoded by a fog, a, a wave of expression of the ligand to this pathway, which is a GPCCR pathway. And that could actually propagate the activity from left to right. 
I'm not going to show you uh, any data, but one to show you that actually you can have a complete propagation of the process while blocking transcription with an inhibitor of RNA pol 2 uh, which is alpha manitin. And you can see here that the wave propagates linearly in the alpha manitin injected embryos, just like in water injected embryos. So this is an example of a process in the early fly embryo, which is running independent of any genetic input. At least once the wave started to propagate, it can propagate without any new transcription, which is quite provocative for early fly embryo, which has been uh, renowned for it being so genetically wired. In fact, the second model, which I'm going to so skip, uh, go very quickly through, is one in which it would be diffusion-based wave, in which the fog morphogen producing the green cells in the pocket would actually diffuse away and allow the propagation at a certain speed. Well, you can make a very simple model of diffusion and degradation and predict what would be the kinetics of propagation of the deformation. In fact, in this case, you have fog is produced, degraded, diffuses away, and activates myosin too. And in this case, what you expect is that the propagation is not linear. It goes at a rate that decays over time and space. And so therefore the prediction is that if you're further away from the source, the rate of activation of myosin 2 should be lower than near the source. Well, in fact, if you look at the data, uh, they are completely in contrast to this prediction, namely that in the propagation zone, the rate of activation in anything, if anything is faster, than in the primordium. This is quantified here on the right. So clearly this, the, the phenomenon is unlike what you predict from a purely diffusion-based model. Uh, and this is also shown here in the simulation that if you increase the rate of production of the ligand, you expect to have a faster rate of activation at the distance than in a control. So we did an experiment that was exactly doing this to test the prediction. We doubled the dose of fog in this primordium and we noticed that the speed of propagation of the, of the uh, wave was completely normal. It was not affected. So the system is, seems to be very robust to the pattern, the dose of the ligand production. So clearly you need an initiator, the fog ligand as an initiator of the process, like you would move a domino. But then the, the rest of the process seems to be completely insensitive to dose and patterns of the ligand. So something else is running, this is allowing this process to run. And the next few slides will document the fact that we understand it as a mechanical process or rather a mechanochemical process with internal feedback. And the process is from this point of view, self-organized rather than genetically programmed. So uh, first, if you use the same sort of computational model that I presented before, what we do now is that we block diffusion. We say there's no diffusion of fog, it's just an initiator. And then what we say, however, is that the stress in the cell which emerges from myositic contractility can feed back on mice into contractility. This is this purple arrow. And by introducing this feedback, you can see that not only can you propagate the stress through the whole tissue and mice into activation, but it does so in a way that is linear, fitting perfectly the analysis that I showed you before. I don't know why uh, the presentation is uh, again collapsing. Sorry about this that allows for a pause of a few seconds. So the prediction of the model is that it are very similar to what we observe, namely that there's a linear propagation of deformation. We did an experiment in which we basically blocked mice into activation using a rock inhibitor and we asked how is rho activity, which is an upstream regulator of myosin 2 activation through ROC, behaving? Normally in the wild type, you will see, this is a control on the, um, on, on the left, uh, rho GTP and myosin 2 propagate uh, uh, at the same speed. In fact, there is an error, biosensor should be at the top for rho and myosin 2 at the bottom. And then we ask when there's a ROC inhibition, how is rho propagation going? And so what you can see is that on the right, as soon as you inject the row, the rock inhibitor, which is the H compound, well, certainly myosin 2 is no longer activated. Again, there's an error. Uh, uh, you should look at myosin 2 at the bottom, row biosensor on the top. The point is that not only is a wave stalled, but row uh, propagation, row GTP propagation is also stalled. And so that tells us that there's the feedback of row activation from myosin 2 activation itself. 
So this is was an essential component of the computational model that I showed you before, which the data uh, are substantiate by this experiment. And that actually stalls the whole process or reduces the speed of propagation of the whole wave. Now, within the cells, as soon as you inject the rock inhibitor, whatever myosin 2 was activated and rho activation also can no longer be stabilized. So there are two phenomena that you have a local internal feedback that stabilizes myosin 2 and rho. And also there's a spatial coupling mechanism that allows the propagation of the activity across cells. We uh, understand this process from looking at it in the site. And I'm focusing on the top at uh, these tissues, at this tissue in the place where myosin to activation is, is propagating in a wave. This is in the white frame. And you can see on the right, the fact that the cells are strongly deformed and, and forming an arc in, at the boundary of the hinge. And, and, and at the bottom, I'm showing you sort of a cartoon representation of what happens. The key element of the model is that you have contractility in orange of all the cells in the furrow. The cells contract, and as they contract, the cytoplasm being incompressible, they cause a compression of the whole tissue onto the right, shown by the green arrows. The compression of the tissue lifts the tissue against the vitellin membrane, which is shown by this gray line. It's like an envelope around the egg. And so literally, we mean that this compression causes the cells to be pushed against the vitellin membrane in this zone, which is uh, in green. So you have compression, and then you have a zone of adhesion, which I'll document later on. And the zone of adhesion somehow, I'll come back to that, leads to myosin 2 activation. Now, when myosin 2 is activated, this is in the cells shown by the red arrow, the cells in the furrow in orange are going to detach the cell by pulling perpendicular to the vitellin membrane. So although they are sticking to the vitellin membrane, this is only a transient process, transient event. There's a de-adhesion that happens after a little lag due to contraction in the furrow. And so the system sort of is, has an internal feedback shown by the sequence of events. And in the context of the whole tissue, that explains the propagation. Because once you have a de adhesion, the cell is gonna join the furrow. And as it joins the furrow, it's going to add to the overall contractility and push to a more anterior region, compression. And compression is going to then cause adhesion of a more anterior set of cells shown in the middle. And then the cell is going to activate myosin 2 and so on and so forth. So the system is really driven by an internal mechanical uh, cycle of um, contractility, compression, adhesion, myosin 2 activation, and de adhesion. And so this adhesion, de adhesion cycle is a key to explain the wave propagation. So, to what is it adhering to? Well, first, evidence that it was adhering to the vitellin membrane came from observation of the fact that dextron that we injected in the vitellin space would be pushed away precisely in the region where myosin 2 is activated. Myosin 2 is in green, dextron is in purple. You can see that there is a zone of exclusion of dextron right where myosin 2 is activated and it propagates as a wave. So it's a wave of exclusion of dextron which corresponds to wave of adhesion. Well, in fact, it turns out that the specific adhesion that I'm referring to is one that is mediated by integrins. In particular, there is a, the zone of genetically programmed expression of integrins called SCAB in blue in this uh, region here, which is right in the dorsal region and is going to expand to this particular dorsal uh, domain in the fly embryo. And that allows for a zone of specific adhesion by integrins. Now, it turns out that when you knock out integrin alpha using RNAi here, well, there's a very profound effect in uh, both the flow of the tissue, and I want to specifically now point to the defect in mice into activation. I'll come back to the flow defects later on. The point is that if you compare on the left, oh, oh, again, I seem to have a bug, but uh, luckily I can relaunch the presentation each time. So what you will see is that myosin 2 activation um, is reduced in the integrin mutant. Um, it, uh, it fails to be activated at the characteristic high levels uh, that you normally see. And this is shown in this quantification here. So you can see that in the chymograph comparing left and right. Oops. Okay, so I think I'm going to use another trick. which is to stop the presentation mode for a little while because I seem to have a problem with a couple of slides. <laughs> 
So in this particular mutant, there is a, um, uh, an, an activation of myosin tool. So you can see my slide now here, and I'm going to um, expand it for a little while. So myosin two, which is normally at this high level, is reduced in the integral mutant quantified here. So I'm going to, um, I only keep a few data, but really stick to this sort of presentation, the idea that um, the process of wave de of deformation of the early embryo looking from the posterior, again, has the genetic component. It's initiated in the primordium by activation of myosin two in a group of cells. And then the other, uh, the elements of the motility, the wave requires some mechanochemical cycle shown in red at the bottom, which requires really contractility, compression, adhesion, some local activation of myosin two, which is integrin dependent, and which I have no time to go into. But for those of you very familiar with integrin, it's, it's a very well-known pathway that actually can use mechanical stimulus to actually cause activation of, of, uh, uh, of downstream molecules. In our instance, um, myosin interactivation activation, we think, is solely induced by the mechanical resistance of contractility due to the coupling to integrin, and that uh, sort of internal strain exerted on myosin to cause its stabilization and activation. So the um, activation of myosin two, which is integrin dependent, reflects a purely uh, mechanochemical uh, properties of integrin uh, uh, adhesion onto the uh, couple actomyosin network. But the, so the key process is that this is uh, propagating in a, in, a, in, a, in, in a cycle. And the reason why it does so is because the embryo is sort of surrounded by a fixed shell whose geometry is a constraint and allows adhesion to be confined to a specific region. And so there you clearly see the, the interlocking of a genetic component as an inducer of a mechanochemical system that allows propagation and the existence of geometry as a boundary conditions to allow this mechanochemical cycle involving integrin to play out. So in the few uh, remaining slides, so first I just want to document the fact that the way we understand the role of integrin shown here in purple and myosin two shown in green is that this is an internal feedback. Uh, we have functional evidence that documents that, that not only does integrin re is required to activate myosin two, but myosin two amplify and strengthen the adhesion for sci and focal adhesions in a way that is well characterized in vitro and is very clearly uh, acting in our instance. Now, I would like to finish with uh, a further elaboration on the concept of geometry being a key element of uh, uh, morphogenesis. And this is really now looking at something which happens slightly earlier than what I showed you. So what I showed you is what is happening in this dorsal half. There's a wave of deformation, but the primordium shown in red is, uh, has an internal dynamics that is required to initiate the whole process. So think of it as a switch uh, tissue that is its internal dynamics is required to elicit the whole movement of the dorsal exoderm that I just talked to you about. So what is happening in this tissue that allows this uh, uh, function? And, and really the, the point is shown by these red arrows. The posterior medgar in red is compressing the dorsal uh, ectoderm in yellow and by, by this property, it allows the initiation of a new wave of deformation. But similarly, we showed a few years ago uh, that the dorsal, the, the posterior endoderm in red is also exerting pulling forces onto the blue colored ectoderm tissue and is essential for this whole tissue to actually flow and rotate around the whole posterior to the right as you can see it. So rather than being sort of a passive linker between two active processes in blue and in yellow, the posterior endoderm is an active linker whose internal dynamics is both pulling on one tissue, pushing on the other, and literally linking, connecting mechanically different uh, internally programmed processes. And so I would like to now address specifically the question is, how is this red tissue moving in such a way that it pushes on one tissue and pulls on the other? So this is the work of two uh, postdocs, uh, two physicists. Emily worked on colloidal physics and she moved to do experiments in the lab and doing fly work. And Banden is a, a theorist. And this is a collaboration with Matthias Merkel at the Turing Center uh, for Living Systems in Martin. It's a wonderful collaboration that illustrates 
uh, how we work together. And I will document to you some experiments and some modeling work that uh, guides our, our current experimental approaches. And this will be my end of my talk. So what I want to emphasize here is really the fact that there's a transition from what we call symmetric flow shown by these yellow arrows on the right. You can see that if you study the flow with PIV, there is a little flow at the beginning uh, in the posterior toward the dorsal, but there is a symmetric flow that is retrograde, is going from the head regions toward the posterior. This flow is symmetric, okay? But later on, flow, it becomes highly asymmetric. You have a symmetry breaking. The pole cells marked in red are going to move toward the anterior, as you can see. And this is plotted by this pole cell movement tracking, which is slowly moving in the symmetric phase and then accelerating steadily in a phase of asymmetric flow. So talking about the emergence of the asymmetry, we first obviously have thought about the role of actomizing contractility. Well, it's simple. If you have a patch of cell that contracts in green, you expect that there will be flow symmetrically around this patch of contraction. And so um, if you look at the uh, myosin-2 pattern on the top, at the phase of symmetric flow, myosin-2 is a sort of at the center of symmetry of this symmetric flow because it's in the basal region in green, uh, in the basal region of the cells in the dorsal ectoderm. But later on at the bottom, at the time when asymmetric flow emerges in the posterior here, you see this asymmetric flow by these yellow arrows here, well then myosin-2 is activated specifically in the epical regions of these epithelial cells. Moreover, we know that when we use a mutant for a G-alpha protein called constatina that is required for myosin-2 activation, so in this mutant, we don't fully remove, but we partially reduce myosin-2 activation epically. Well, then the flow is initially symmetric. So that corresponds to this phase of slow flow, but the acceleration that is so characteristic of the wild type is now uh, affected strongly in the mutant telling us that the apical myosin-2 activation is essential for the emergence of the asymmetric flow. And that corresponds specifically to I for myosin-2 activation. Now, we decided to uh, use a, a, a theoretical approach to guide our intuition and test, make some specific predictions about what is required to make a flow. And so the model is a huge simplification, but that's its value. It's a one-dimensional flow. You know, we use it to photon, we cut through the whole embryo. So we have a line that is curved. And we ask using this 1D representation and saying that the tissue is like a continuum medium, continuous medium that has some internal flow. It's like a fluid. So we can describe it effectively as there's a viscous force. Uh, eta is viscosity, V is velocity. We have an active tension that comes from myosin too. So these are the internal forces. And by balance of force, we also have external forces, which is friction, or think of adhesion for you, if you want, and gamma would be the friction coefficient. Now, you can rewrite this equation in a way that shows up two free parameters shown in red. The free parameters is the hydrodynamic length scale that I introduced uh, early on in my talk, LH, which depends on viscosity and friction, and R, which is essentially the rate of contraction per unit of mice into intensity. And the value here is that that is something that we can, uh, that, that has a, an equivalence to, uh, uh, sorry, these three parameters LH and R show up in a context where we can actually show, show reveal experimental values like IT is minus into intensity, which we can measure, and V is velocity, which you can measure with uh, uh, PIV uh, experiments. So an analysis. So really, now we have an equation that shows some free parameters that allows a direct comparison to experimental data. And so at the bottom, you can see, you know, what would be the fitting, the values of the fitting parameters to have a, 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 a good a fit as possible to the experimental data. Predictions are in dashed line and data are in this uh, sort of uh, more noisy data in the background. You can see that at the phase of symmetric flow, we can do a very good fitting. Having this fit parameters set up, then we can ask what uh, would be the predictions of the velocity around the whole egg given force balance, which always have to be respected. And so in that, what we show is the average velocity over the whole circumference of the embryo. So if flow is symmetric, as shown at the bottom, you know, if you average, you have some positive velocity in one half and negative velocity in the other, so you set them to zero. And this is essentially what you see, you know, as a, as a function of time, 
when you have uh, plot the average velocity and when you just have mice intercontractility. What I mean to say is that if you have mice interactivation posteriorly, well, you're going to have flow that is symmetric around it. And so you're going to have an average velocity and this will not change. So clearly, if you just had mice intercontractility, wherever you put it, dorsally, ventrally, posteriorly, wherever, all you can expect is to have symmetric flow around it. And this is clearly not what we see, because remember that we see the emergence of an asymmetric flow, which will show up as a positive value when you do the average velocity around the whole fly uh, embryo. So something is missing. So we turn now to a further elaboration of the computational model. We ask, well, let's add something we know exists, which is that there is a zone of adhesion in the dorsal posterior half of the embryo, which is mediated by integrin. It's called friction or adhesion doesn't matter here. We can define its domain and we can mathematically represent it in a slightly more elaborated version of this equation. Now we can have the same approach. We ask, you know, we can fit the data at the stage of symmetric flow. Uh, and so we can use this fitting to then ask, well, what is a predicted velocity profile given force balance? And so you can change the extent of friction. So uh, delta being zero is basically, as I showed you before, no friction. And then as you increase it, well, you certainly now allow flow to emerge. Think of friction being something akin to a fixed point, although it's not strictly fixed, it allows the flow to emerge because of this external force. And so then, it, because it's regionalized, you expect to have flow towards the zone of friction. And so the extent of the velocity will be greater as you increase the friction strength all the way to a maximal value. But the key point is that velocity will be constant over time. It's not going to increase. However, experimentally, as we know, the velocity is accelerating, is increasing. So clearly, although flow emerges asymmetrically with friction, it doesn't do in a way that is uh, 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 conform, uh, 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 observed experimentally, which is that it is accelerating. So again, something else is missing. What might it be? Well, first, I want to show you some experimental data that indeed document that although friction is important, it turns out to be so essential for the emergence of uh, the asymmetric flow, the symmetry breaking. Well, the first one is what I already sort of mentioned quickly, which is that in a scab mutant integrin, which is expressed right when you expect adhesion to be so important, well, in the mutant, you will see at the bottom, the side view of the tissue, and you compare with the top, which is the uh, wild type. Clearly, the furrow is shallower, but clearly you see that the flow happens. The tissue zips to the anterior, just like it does in the wild type. So in the, um, uh, in the integrin mutant, where there's no uh, adhesion that we can detect, then uh, friction, then uh, the flow still emerges. So that suggests that you know we uh, we uh, we don't need adhesion or friction emitted by integrins to actually allow the symmetry breaking. And and conversely, we can now expect scab everywhere in the embryo. We sort of break the specific domain of adhesion to the dorsal region, and we ask what happens. Well, in that the embryo is severely affected, but although everything is slowed down and affected in interesting ways there will be some symmetry breaking. You see that it sort of attempts to rotate and it does so, and then it's blocked for reasons which are very interesting, but is sort of another, re another reason. So clearly, symmetry breaking can happen in spite of uniform high friction all around. So that lends support to the prediction of the model that friction, although it's required for flow, is not uh, a, a necessary, uh, the only component that is required for the symmetry breaking. Something else is happening that would have to account for the acceleration of speed. And so that will be sort of my last uh, hypothesis, which is what else is missing? And this is where we will uh, just find again an essential role of geometry. Well, that turns out to be something which is inherited together with the bag of genes, which is the shape of the egg. And it, specifically what I mean is a curvature gradient of the egg. The egg is not a sphere like it is in some other organisms. It's an ellipsoid shown in purple in pink, and the offset between the tension gradient and the curvature gradients is predicted to have a huge impact on flow. And that is shown here. So here we modify the equations. Myosin 2 will have two manifestations. This tension gradient, DTA over DS, which you had before, plus this term, which shows an active moment, which depends on the difference between epical and basal myosin 2, and the curvature gradient, DC over DS. And this term, is going to have an impact on the flow. Well, in fact, 
at the bottom is basically showing you that although you can get a good fit with the friction model at the stage of symmetric flow, if you now ask, well, how well can you fit if you look at the stage of asymmetric flow? Well, the fit actually no longer works when you just have friction. This is shown in red compared to the data in black. However, now if you introduce curvature following these equations, now you can get actually a very good fit to the data by the introduction of a curvature term with an active moment and a curvature gradient. So clearly here this shows that curvature does a better job to fit the data. But now having this fit, you can ask, well, can you explain the acceleration of velocity? Yes, you can. And this is shown here. You can see that now velocity is not a constant in time. It actually increases uh, as, uh, as, uh, as you go down the gradient all the way to a maximum. And then it's, and then it's over. Now you can even add now on top of the curvature term, tension, or sorry, uh, friction. And you, of course, you predict that uh, this will also have an impact on the velocity, but the trend is the same, that velocity will increase. So obviously now we are uh, keen on trying to test specifically this experimentally by the predictions being that if you go into a region of no curvature gradient or modify curvature gradient, the velocity profile will change. And there are uh, things that we are about to test and I'm happy to discuss this if you're interested. I'm going to conclude. I think I've showed you that to predict a certain tissue dynamics and shaping of an embryo, you certainly need genes, but you need much more. You need the biochemistry, which is contractility here, activated by the raw GPCR pathway, genetically encoded by positional information that is going to control mechanics, which is contractility by myosin two. But you also need geometry, which is going to basically define uh, a certain uh, uh, landscape of curvature and the offset between the tension gradient in green and the curvature gradient in blue is actually an information that actually dictates the existence of an asymmetric flow, its directionality and its amplitude. And it's really the offset between the two which is so important. Now, interestingly, because mechanics change geometry, you predict that there will be feedback that will happen later on as the tissue changes its own shape, it changes its own curvature, and so on. And so my last statement is uh, uh, sort of uh, a, uh, in more general. We are all familiar with the idea that, especially in development, that genes are inherited, and also in cell biology, genes are inherited through chromosomes and is essential to perpetuate a state of organization and dynamics through generations. But what I want to say is that this is not the sole template upon which dynamics can emerge. The other template is geometry. In the instance that I showed you, it was a curvature of the egg, which is inherited from the mother. But take cell division. In fact, the membrane itself is inherited. This is a template upon which more uh, activity can emerge. And so I think this goes into the more general concept that there are two kinds of heredity. One is obviously genetic, and there's this other one which is under our eyes, but I think largely under appreciated, which is what I call a structural heredity. It is the sort of a template upon which more activity can be inherited. And this is probably what is largely missing, for instance, in organoid studies and embryoid bodies that people study. And people try hard to, try to actually add such structural template to actually uh, see the emergence of reproducible robust patterns. And this is what is seen in development and what is missing in in vitro systems. And uh, I just finished with this view of program and self-organization. I think what we need to better appreciate is the power of self-organization given genetic and geometric templates. So I thank my collaborators. Uh, I've named them along the, 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 the talk, uh, Bandon, Claudio, Emily, and uh, Anais, are three physicists and one biologist. Some do experiments, others do models. This is a great collaboration with Matthias Merkel at the moment, and they are shown in pictures. I thank funding, and I thank all of you for uh, uh, listening to this talk, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Toma, for this uh, wonderful and encompassing uh, talk. Um, so I think we have questions that starts to appear in the chat. Maybe I leave the first question to Rongli. Rong, if you want to, to uh, ask the question yourself as the others are lining up. Yeah, I, I just have a question about um, when you talk about the propagation of uh, this myosin wave and the row activation, you, um, you propose that is the compression of the, uh, yep. uh, the basal side. Um, yep. what, 
how would you distinguish that possibility from stretching on the, the other side of the membrane? So stretching from the apical side, you mean? Apical side. Because well, actually, the, uh, yeah, and this is a very interesting observation. So we struggled for a long time because what we observed is that there was definitely evidence of stretching of the apical surface. But mm -hmm. at the same time, when we looked on the side, we, we, it was obvious that the cells were compressed. So how could you reconcile being compressed in one end and being stretched in the other, which is your question? Well, in fact, right. in fact, it's... Uh, I would argue that the um, the uh, uh, tension in the apical surface is a consequence to some extent of the compression at the bottom because you have a uh, the um, you have a zone of adhesion to a vitellin membrane through integrins. So you know if you have a cell that is stitching to one part and you and you move the base by compression, while well, you effectively are going to stretch the apical surface because of the uh, connection uh, adhesion to the vitellin membrane. You know, if you if you take a cell that is now adhering to a substratum and you have an external foil that is going to move the cell body to some region, well, there will be shear on the apical surface, and that is going to actually you know cause some some kind of apical tension. So we think that the um, the stretching of the cell on the lateral surface on the apical surface is a consequence of one adhesion, and second uh, uh, the uh, uh, compression on the basal side, and indeed. Uh, the phase of extension of the apical surface corresponds to a phase when actually the actin cortex becomes immobilized in the referential of the microscopes, which is that of the embryo. And that is integrin dependent. And we can even document that advection is reduced to a minimum in this instance. Can you use uh, micro -manip manipulation to separate those two mechanical effects, compression well, versus uh, stretching? And to see it's which one directly it's difficult, it's difficult because activity. everything everything is connected i mean the only thing we can do oh. is to uh, lower adhesion by integrins in that case you will still have compression now what's interesting in this case is that so what i said is one part of the story but it's not the soul because you definitely have cells in the furrow which pull you know on, on, on their neighbors and stretch them so in an integrin mutant the cells are still stretched actually apically. And this is because of the contraction in the in the in the in the in the furrow. And if actually if you remove myosin 2 by a rock inhibitor, then that is gone. Okay. So uh, I, I think there, there there are some um the I don't think we have a complete understanding of how uh the cells um uh, are actually, you know, how all the stress propagates uh to explain uh, all of these features. What we know is that in the wild type, the actual stretching and spreading of the apical surface requires compression, but we know that we could get another kind of stretching when we don't have adhesion um, just because of the contractility. I think if you block both adhesion and contractility, then the cells lose the stretching uh, um, apically. Well, thank okay. you for a great talk, beautiful talk. Thanks. Thank you. So the next question is from uh, Amita Jabal. So if you want to uh, ask the question yourself. Hi, um, I'm not really a, a, a lab guy. I'm a specialist in orthodontics, so I deal mainly with growth and development. But my interest is in, in the field of how the mandible is uh, actually grows during early life, etc. Uh, but one of the things which I was a bit uh, um, um, interested in is what about the calcified components of um, the cellular matrix? Will that have a major effect on the shape as well? And will that be separate to the biochemistry as such? Well, so I'm not familiar much with the field of, uh, you know, bone and, and, and all of that. I know enough to tell you that this is an ECM whose material, material properties change as a function of time. You know, with calcium and, and many other things. So I talked to you about the vitellin membrane. It's also an ECM, um, which is used by cells as a substratum to build its own mechanics to modify it. So I think very generally, cells would sample and sense their environment, which is made of other cells of ECM, whose, you know, viscoelastic plastic properties are uh, can be tuned genetically uh, um, and uh, by cells. It could be modified by the environment. And all of those will, of course, have a feedback on, on selectivity. 
So whether you think about mandibles, uh, tooth development, bone, all of that, you know, will you know have an impact on uh, on the way um, things develop. As you know, you know, uh, muscles uh, are organized. Uh, through the uh, mechanical coupling that tendons to bones because they are rigid materials. So uh, if, if you uh, fail that coupling, you know, muscles uh, fail to actually sustain and, and grow. And this is uh, something very well known. So yes, very generally, uh, you know, what you work on, what you're interested in can be connected to what I showed you by just saying that the only sort of hard material that cells use here is the vitellin membrane and all eggs, even chick em embryos, you know, you have a vitellin membrane. This is a substratum and this is very ubiquitously important. Great, thanks. The next question is from Carling. She doesn't have a mic, so I'll read the question for you. Do you think there is a potential increase of friction during gastrulation, which can also contribute to the increase of flow velocity? So the important thing about flow mediated by friction is that if friction is strong and in a regional domain, it's like a fixed point that will, uh, that will have flow directed to it, but up to a limit. At some point, flow cannot no longer because you've sort of pulled everything to the fixed point. So the fixed, if, if the friction or addition is a fixed point, it's a transient flow. This is not what we see, and I alluded to it. Friction has to be moved away to more interior regions progressively to allow the sustenance of the flow. This is actually what we do in the model. What we do in the model is that, you know, we have a local friction whose value can be tuned. And then we say, you know, in a way that we introduce, we move it to more interior region, okay? This happens actually in the tissue by the mechanism that I described in the middle of my talk. I showed you that there's a wave of adhesion it happens a bit later on, but actually we think that it begins in this early phase. So in other words, we, we, we have a, uh, a, 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 it's not a fixed point. A fixed point has been characterized by uh, Pavel Tomanchak and Stephen Grills in Tribolium Egg, which was published, uh, uh, you know, a year and a half ago. And in this case, it allows some transient flow. It seems to be, although we have to look in more details, uh, whether it's a true fixed point, but that's what they seem to report. In our case, the zone of adhesion is a way is, is moving as a wave, and so it's, it's sort of a, can be used as a as a moving uh, anchor point to actually steer the whole tissue by an external force that stems from it. So that's what I have to say. So does it increase over time? We have no evidence that it increases over time, but it definitely moves as a function of time, and that is essential, as I just said. Okay. Next question is from uh, Anupama. Do you want to ask the question yourself? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, my question is kind of like broad and general, but I just wanted to know you claim the geometry acts as a template to determine shape. Uh, yeah. What would you expect if the shape of the embryo were to change perhaps? Like, yeah, well, what I can predict is that if the, there was no gradient of curvature, so if the egg was spherical, then flow will not be asymmetric. There will be symmetric flow from around any patch of, um, of contractility. If you had a little domain of contraction, there would be, oh sorry, a little domain of adhesion, friction, there would be a symmetric flow, but they will be transient. If you want flow to uh, be uh, uh, sustained and increase over time, you need a grain of curvature. So we cannot, so we can change the curvature of the egg. There are mutants that make it less elongated and more roundish. We predict that flow will emerge, but might be delayed or reduced in speed because of the different gradient of curvature. But we can do another experiment, which is in a way easier, or at least uh, on paper is, uh, but there's some difficulty, which is to move the contraction, because as I said, it's not the gradient of curvature per se that matters, it's the offset between the gradient of curvature and the gradient of contractility. So if you move the domain of myosin to activation from where it is now in the wild type, which is offset to region of no curvature gradient, okay? So that there is no mm -hmm. offset, okay? Yeah. Well, one case is known is a, is a posterior, is a dorsal mutation. In the dorsal mutant, myosin is activated symmetrically around the uh, geometric center of symmetry, which is a posterior pole of the embryo. 
And in that case, we know there's no asymmetric flow. Flow is symmetric from both sides around it, and you don't have any symmetry breaking. But we can do another experiment, which is to move now contractility to the dorsal region in the region of zero uh, uh, curvature gradient, okay? Because it's from the side, it's a sphere, it's a, it's a ring, it's a, it's a disc. And from the interpersonal axis, you know, it's nearly flat. And there you expect that there again, there would be symmetric flow around it and no asymmetry. The experiment has been done in a way by Stefano Dorenzis when they use their optogenetic system and we're going to use it again to actually quantify that more rigorously. And we, uh, we, we expect to see that there will be no asymmetric flow. So there are two ways to test it by using optogenetics and there is one uh, by using different curvature gradient. We cannot but produce perfectly roundish spherical egg, unfortunately. Okay, but these embryos don't develop or like... Develop? No, they have a patch of contraction, but mm -hmm. it is, instead of moving to, an, to a more anterior region, you know, the, it's, it's stuck there. And so the whole invagination of the endoderm is affected and that has a very profound impact in terms of gastrulation, which stalls mm -hmm. and the embryo is, is going to die, yeah. Okay, thank you. So it's not a minute little thing on the side. It's it's a major okay. major it's a major function. Yeah, okay. Got it. Thanks. Okay. The next question is from uh Yuching Long. Do you want to ask? Um yeah, sure. Uh Tom, thank you very much for a very nice talk. And I think my question kind of connects to the previous two. And uh well, sorry if it's uh, obvious for experts. Uh just wondering like the initial positioning of the uh the friction, basically the offset, how how is it actually um patterned? And is the initial position uh, also somehow associated with the great, uh, curvature gradient in, in a normal situation? So, sorry, the last question. Sorry, I missed it. The oh, video. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so the last part is like um, you mentioned that uh, you can uh, experimentally change the position of this friction. But then yeah. the original, I mean, the, the wall type uh, position, how is it uh, determined? Okay. Okay. So how is everything determined? I would say bluntly, genetically. <laughs> There is this patterning activity uh, that has been very well characterized. Uh, it, for our purpose, there are two orthogonal systems. There is a so-called dorsal, dorsal ventral polarity system, which makes a gradient of difference across the DV axis. And the other one is a terminal system. It's just activating. So there is an RTK, uh, so receptor torus and kinase pathway that is activated selectively in the posterior pole. And there's a dorsal ventral pathway that is uh, through the tall system that is working along the DV axis. And the intersection of the two allows for the specific transcription of scab dorsal region, for the specific uh, activation of myosin 2 via fog ligand production in the posterior. So the thing is that fog is produced symmetrically, but myosin 2 and rho and rock are slightly shifted. We don't know why. We suspect there's maybe a gap, a row gap that is, uh, you know, activated in the ventral half. We don't know. Actually, we, we plan to study it, but we haven't yet done it. So, but it's pretty clear. It's genetic. If you use a dorsal mutant, then all of these genes activity is symmetric around the dorsal ventral axis. And then, you know, the consequence I just said is that you have no flow. Yeah, thank you. And uh, maybe I should like specify my question a bit better. So yeah, indeed there is a genetic pattern of the positioning of the friction, yes. then, but then it needs to be associated with the curvature gradient. So maybe then yeah. the other side is that how is the curvature gradient determined to oh, be right. precisely yeah. as an offset? Yeah. Well, the curvature gradient is now set up maternally, but at a different stage. The egg polarity uh, is uh, the chemical polarity that I just mentioned is done sometimes during oogenesis and is inherited in the, in the mother by the existence of chemical gradients. Now the shape of the egg is molded by the follicular epithelial layer, which is an envelope around the uh, uh, egg in the egg chamber that forms the egg. And uh, it's a beautiful system of contractility. Uh, uh, um, I want to refer to the work of Sally Horn by the Vinac at University of Chicago, who is studying, um, there are many other groups, but she's one of those doing this beautiful work, studying how actually the active dynamics of the follicular cell actually molds literally the egg in its sort of elliptic shape. And actually some mutants that make it more roundish are mutants that affect this particular dynamics of the follicular epithelial cells, like FAT2 mutants uh, is a good example of that. So it's all done by the mother and she transmits that to the egg in terms of geometry and chemical activity. It's a double inheritance, yeah. Thank you.
I, I have one question, Thomas. Uh, there's, you, you emphasized a lot about the compression of the cells as the, the tissue moves and invaginates or tension. Yeah. But there's, to me, what, what is also very striking is that you have these cells invaginating in the yolk. So you know, why, why is it that the, the flux in the yolk, the fact that the yolk can actually push the cells toward the vital, what, why do you a priori, or is it a priori that you remove that component or it's just that it's hard to study? Because if the yolk is very viscous, you can have very strong transient components in it, a mechanical, mechanical contribution. Well, in fact, you're right. You know, I, I drew the contraction and then I showed some green arrows. You see, I put some arrows going to the right, some are going to the top, you know, in principle, some going to the bottom, you know, it's going to flow wherever it can. I think the pressure of the, uh, of the yolk uh, is going to be important to uh, allow the cells to be compressed toward the vitellin membrane. In other words, uh, if, the, if we could remove the, the amount of the yolk in the egg, we'd expect that the, the, the pattern of, of uh, compression, and in particular, the capacity of the, of the tissue to actually move toward the vitellin membrane would be altered. So yeah. it, it's an important boundary condition, which we have not characterized uh, you know, in the model in any uh, rigorous way. Uh, we are not there yet, but we, I think in, in the model, what we can use is basically some pressure difference uh, to basically set the boundary conditions. And that's what we do. But uh, yeah. The volume is not conserved. It must be, the yolk must be, as, as the tissue invaginates, the yolk has to go somewhere. Either being exactly. Different. Yeah. So the, this is another interesting aspect. It's, it's an incompressible viscous fluid. So apart from the viscous component, which detects the speed of the process, the fact that it's an incompressible fluid and it has to go somewhere causes uh, some potential coupling between different regions in the egg. Like it's going to flow some region and so it's going to do something. So yeah, this is a very fascinating problem, which I think we would want to address once we manage to have kind of a shell um, 3D model of the whole thing, because it's going to flow in all directions. Uh, what I can um, uh, tell you is that when we do vertex model simulation, which I didn't show, we find that you know the pattern of contractility dictates some local curvature and flow, but the shape of the curvature is, is highly abnormal. It doesn't get inside enough. Well, the, the reason we think is because you know it needs space. It takes space to actually create a furrow. And the bigger the furrow, the more yolk you have to move around. And there are constraints associated with that. Where does it go? You have conservation of matter. You are in a fixed geometry. So yeah, it's it's a very interesting problem that. You know, we only began. I think the intuition is the following. If you have a small, tiny invagination, the volume change of the yolk in a given region is going to be tiny. So, you know, the displacement over the whole egg is going to be minimal. But if you are going to move, you know, say 30% of the yolk, well, that is going to have some, to put some huge constraints and maybe you cannot invaginate. And a pure speculation here is, this is probably why you need this traveling wave to make a big invagination. You do it small somewhere, and then you propagate it because it's easier to do it than if you do it all at once in one region. You see what I mean? This is just a speculation. I think we want to address it in a 3D model at some point. It will come at some point, but it's it's an interesting problem where you couple hydraulics and uh, and contractility and geometry. Okay. So besides very laudative comments on the quality of the talk in the chat, I see no more questions. Are there any any questions for uh, Thomas that you would like to ask? Not really. Okay. Well, thank you for these great questions. Thank you for the very good talk. Uh, I, you know, based on the comments, I'm sure everyone enjoyed it. Uh, okay. So, you know, I have you a good day and it was a pleasure to uh, see some familiar faces. Uh, and voices, and I hope that we'll have a chance to see each other soon, wherever. <laughs> Come to Marseille, happy to host you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sasha, you, it everyone. was good to see you, Thank you. you. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye, Ron. Bye, Virgil. Bye, everybody. Bye. And thank you to the Ambassade de France for their support and, and all of that. Thank you very much, Thomas, Professor Thomas. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.